that there is a movement underneath us right now. And that movement is some form of a digital movement where there are stars of its own. And uh, one can just literally go connect with people there. And the connections are made much faster. It's far more democratic. Hello and welcome to the Anahita Speaker Series presented by Carnegie India, celebrating stirring stories of empowerment, struggle and success from women professionals in different fields across the globe. Stories we hope are bound to inspire young professionals. I'm Shibani Mehta, Senior Research Analyst with the Security Studies Program at Carnegie India. Today we have with us Ms. Shelly Chopra, founder, She the People, and Gayatri. Shelly created the game-changing She the People TV, India's first women-only platform focused on content, community, and skill development in 2015. And today, the platform has an annual digital reach of over 400 million. She is the recipient of the Ramnath Goenka Award for Journalism, India's most significant journalism award. Shelly has authored four books, including Sisterhood Economy, which we are going to talk about a little today. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, Shelly, and to talk about your professional career and how the path of becoming a self-made entrepreneur in the digital landscape. Um, we are honored to have you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here, part of the Anahita series. So we'll just jump right into it. Um, you started your professional career as a journalist. Was journalism something that you knew you would do as a child or is it something that you kind of stumbled upon as you sort of went to school and college? So like many people in the early part of careers, they, um, they eliminate a lot of what they don't want to do. So I think that exercise really helped me uh, decide what I wanted to do. Uh, so I chose to um, look at many popular opportunities, um, you know, for careers for women in the 90s, uh, 20s, 2000s period. Um, and I realized that uh, I was very inclined towards finance. Uh, at one point, I nearly thought I'll do an MBA. And I think I might have been really good at it. But um, then I realized that, you know, I was thoroughly enjoying the presence of public speaking in my life, something that I got training into summer, uh, you know, summer after summer through these summer schools. And I felt that there was there was a power in being able to take stage. And so as I started doing that in college and school, uh, you know, just sort of being the person who leads a conversation or leads a discussion or debate or elocution, I kind of inclined towards possibilities. Um, journalism on television was basically reduced to a couple of bulletins on Doordarshan, right? And uh, cable news was still far, but it got exciting once I started seeing cable news and watching the BBC and seeing Lee's Doucette outside war situations. So I was highly inspired by that. Um, so in short, while uh, partly this was by accident, um, it was also partly by just at some point at the right time in my life, finding the inspiration on what it means to be out there and tell a new story every single day. No, it's a very happy uh, accident, uh, if I may say so. So you were talking about being a journalist, a TV journalist in the 90s, the sort of opportunity you have um, versus the kind of stories that you wanted to tell. And now, over the last 20 years, you've worked in sort of India's biggest newsrooms and have grown to become one of the top editor presenters. How do you navigate a space like news media in the 90s, early 2000s as a woman? Um, do you have to change your beliefs and ideas or do you just hold on to them and 
persist so i think the answer to this is a bit of both uh because it's hard to persist in an environment that um you know where you can't command your space so i think uh, like perhaps many women in different professions one of the things i learned early was that having talent and the ability to show your work do the talking was one of the critical portions of how i wanted to build my career so i never spoke ahead of my abilities um this was not necessarily as a woman this was a principle as a person for me that if i can prove what my works worth then my standing and ground are very very solid uh, and i i maintain that i started uh, fairly early in an era when television was um, perhaps only across one or channel and the only uh, you know business channel was at that point still not doing live television we were recording tapes and running them around to uplink on a satellite so it was uh, very fascinating to see how this process of uh, you know journalism television broadcast was slowly but surely evolving and therefore when i uh, started my career uh, i actually invested most of my time uh, focusing on learning uh, i wanted to work with the best editors i could in the companies that i did and i was very fortunate to get that opportunity much faster much ahead of many other young people and through an accident in the first 6 months of my job of my first job uh, i got an opportunity to go into the studio and uh, deliver my first bulletin literally with 3 minutes notice so you know some anchor had fallen ill and not showed up and this person in the newsroom really needed a warm body to go and get this done and uh, he sent me in and i think i came back uh, you know doing what i was trained to do and you know it really went off well so i got that opportunity right but i didn't get this opportunity without showing that i was extremely responsible knew my stuff and i understood what these bulletins demand i had done that in the first 6 months in a way that they were finding that i was a dependable resource so at that point i didn't think of myself as a woman at all i thought that this is like the toil that any individual needs to uh, undertake but as i grew i started recognizing that the problems emerge in leadership positions or your way to the leadership positions when you start having a say in how things should be done what must be said and what must be written um and that was no different for me either uh, while i was fortunate to, to have organizations led by men recognize my talent uh, pay me my worth give me my opportunities i think many times i would come back and wonder you know if i had done this i would have done it differently but when will i have the courage to say that when will i be in a position where somebody will listen to me so um uh, when again today's world is slightly different than that um it was difficult to speak up even if you were right but more importantly if you spoke up was somebody listening right so i think one of the investments one does in um, hard work and talent is to reach the point where people are listening and not just you speaking and i think that was really uh, important for me and this this was sort of proved because i was within a year and a half poached by ndtv to set up their new business channel as a as a girl who was probably just 23 at that point um which was an exhilarating moment uh, to have that kind of opportunity uh, and be a builder of sorts so as um, 90s uh, and 2000s saw my career flourish uh soon enough i realized i was a very young woman with a very strong voice um that was beginning to intimidate people and wonder if they should give me more opportunities right uh and that remained with me for some time because i wouldn't budge i i was um i would hustle and i would be around asking for my worth uh and i would speak up and i recognize that this is not something that most women can do so i feel that there was a turning point in my career when i literally told somebody in my third office um that i really don't care about you know your cabin or your ceo position or your managing editor position i know what i want so i think the other thing that most women struggle with is to get into these power position tactics like you know power only resides in the cabin of the of the corner office i've never been like that i always see the power coming from public if it's my face on television they know me 
they don't know the guy or the woman or the person in the cabin so i used to really justify this for myself in a positive way that if i focused on who i was the person for the people the news giver or what people wanted to hear the credible voice of journalism did i really want to validate myself through the position of a cabin right so i think some of those things were really important to me and they wouldn't have come until i had convinced myself and done enough to prove that i was stellar at the work i was doing and after that it was okay uh, because i wasn't hungry for necessarily becoming an ex i didn't want to be part of the designations market but i was the face when i walked the road people spoke to me not to somebody else this was an extremely empowering piece it's not meant to be a haughty reflection of who i wanted to be but yes that's who i wanted to be the person that people knew so i did navigate um the entire piece around uh, women i would say a bit selfish selfishly which i think every person should be about their career without um, insinuating or spoiling somebody else's career for your personal gain but at the same time recognizing that when you navigate spaces navigate them in a way that you come out a winner and that people don't use that navigation as a reason to pull you down if you know what i mean you know yeah no um i especially like your point about it's not just about speaking out but also making sure that people are listening yeah. um and so i want to come to she the people and um as i'd mentioned in the introduction took off in sort of 2015 but the idea for it kind of stemmed i read much earlier i think 2008 or 9 if i'm not mistaken yeah yeah, yeah. so what did what did you see that was missing in the digital landscape where you felt that you have to engage with the community where you have to have content that is focused on women um and skill development so actually what i saw was missing was not in the digital landscape really i thought it was completely absent in mainstream media back then digital was not mainstream at all and so uh, for me digital became the outlet where one would experiment some of these and see how they are lapped up by audiences and communities and people because inherently she the people is um a content driven community tech platform that brings women together to interact and explore new ideas and opportunities so the way for me was um very very clear that there is only that much life of a broadcast media when digital is growing okay and i might have said this slightly earlier for its times but yes in 2008 i was beginning to um get strong feelers from my time spent at davos at g20 and many other global conferences for which i very regularly went to report on that there is a movement underneath us right now and that movement is some form of a digital movement where there are stars of its own and uh, one can just literally go connect with people there and the connections are made much faster it's far more democratic now uh, versus let's say the broadcast space uh, which also is a great deal about money power right uh, it rests on having large outdoor vans and it has like this entourage and studios and real estate and what not So when she the people as an idea was born it was born in the construct of what was missing in the broadcast world which is talking about women talking about women who were doing much more than just the 10 women we see and saw for decades and decades in magazines and newspapers how are we different how are we telling different stories and really where were the women you know the audience was men the speakers were men people i interviewed were men where were the rest of um, where were the rest of the people in the country i i e women and so that became a an observation that sort of snowballed into a thud for me one day saying that okay this is it now because if i don't try it now when will i that was really powerful because i've never felt um, i've never felt the urge to literally stand up from my seat and never go back to it you know uh, it takes time also we get addicted to being television stars and being accosted on the road for an autograph of picture this that and the other you know these things go to your head and you were like i am getting up from this room in 2014 right 13 14 and saying this is goodbye television right and i'm still in my early 30s right so it was a very um moving decision for me and a damn scary one 
Uh, so while the idea of She the People germinated in my head on a little piece of tissue in 2008, and I wrote the word She the People and forgot about it, I actually started actioning it in 2015. Um, and I put up the platform and it started out just like something that will tell stories of different women. But it snowballed by itself into something that women wanted. They said, not only are you just going to start building it, the rest will take over. We want to be a community. We want to set this up as something where we can meet and have these events and, you know, have recognition um, and also tell really powerful stories from how women are molested on Indian streets every day to how they become CEOs, defying a lot of things or internalizing a lot of problems. And that became really um, a revolution of sorts. So in many ways, what started as the women's channel uh, seven years ago is actually a women's movement uh, and is shaping the way women think and I don't say that when you go to our various sections around social media or the website you will see how many women um, and men write to us about how she the people change the way they think and I can't imagine anything that's more powerful than somebody telling you that they change the way how they think you know that's a tough one to do to change people's thinking and mindsets and it gives me goosebumps every time I remember those stories. And they come from everywhere, from Siliguri, from Khatima in Uttarakhand, which is a rice belt, from Ludhiana, from Salem, Bangalore, Mumbai, Delhi. And it's very heartening to see that. In fact, during COVID, we got these stories from the United States. Suddenly, we were being read and watched tremendously in the US. Hadn't happened to us before. So I think it was really important to go after something that I didn't think would um, would have such wings to itself but it was certainly a thing i very 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 felt strongly about right um and i think there a decision with the heart than mind really proved that this would become a strong decision which my mind would actually see seven years later right or whatever five years later because we're a business we're no longer a, a website we're a network five languages few chatbots you know different uh, social presence, 20 million eyeballs. We're not talking about a small fry here. And it's women, it's women, <laughs> I'm just saying. Women. Yeah. It's women. women. Telling stories. Yes, um, yes. But yes, like you said, it's beyond a digital platform, a website of like content curation. She the yeah. People is now a network, it's a community. And I, so I just wanted to get to know a little bit more about your idea of sisterhood. Um, it's not always easy for women to support women or find support in other women. Um, sometimes we also kind of go against each other. So how does that feature in building a community of women? So since you mentioned my new book, I'm actually going to show it. Okay. This is Sisterhood Economy. And this book is just out a few weeks ago, and it's doing really well for the simple reason that we never think that women can come together and create magic. We are just internalized to believe, like you and I do, that women are often against each other. And I think that's part of the problem, uh, because I have never been able to come to terms with the notion that we have so many shared issues, but yet we're at each other's necks. You know, we could come together and actually solve many spokes of the wheel for each other much faster, much better, and give the other a chance to not reinvent it. But somehow we have, we have glorified the idea that sacrifice and pain must not just be, you know, must, must be experienced by everyone in their road to success. And I think that's a very flawed argument. If somebody's figured how to solve a problem, don't let others go through that problem. Give them the solution, let them deal with the next problem, right? We don't do that. Let me take a step back and talk about what, um, what we say when we talk about the importance of spotlighting uh, women and ec their economics, right? It is the simple fact that today we need women to stand up on their own go into workplaces, see that the work they're doing at home is measured and are able to ensure that they count. Currently, we don't count. We count in a very small, narrow definition of what is organized labor. That's also why we have gone from 35% to 25% and I think we're now closer to the 20s than the 25s on the female labor force 
participation. All of this is a factor of not just economics or statistics or even opportunities. It is a factor of the many other underlying things at play, which we just choose to ignore and blame it on society. Who is society? It's you, me, our parents, our in-laws, our friends, our colleagues, right? I mean, it's not like this colossal nemesis that is sitting out there and we can keep blaming it and it's not going to budge. So the problem is that we don't think about things that women should have equality, not just at the workplaces, but also in the bed sheets. We don't talk about the importance of what we show on television and call it pop culture. Whose pop culture is it? We don't question uncles and aunts in WhatsApp groups when they openly come out there and, you know, roll over the carpet of patriarchy and present jokes that are not deserving of being called jokes, right? We don't call each other out in private or public to science, try and see if I can fix the path somebody that we love is taking. We don't blame our mothers. I always say this and I say this in the book also. Women are not just half the population, they raise the other half. And I'm not trying to say that the burden of fixing everything in the world should remain with women as a result. But I think there is certain some fixes can, that can be done at the source code of the problem. Raise better boys, raise more confident girls. Why can't we get this out? Does any of this, what I said just now, sound like economics to you? That's what sisterhood economy is about, where I redefine the concept of an economy and question why we don't recognize all of these factors as players into that economic outcome. This, the day we start doing that, numbers will fix themselves, opportunities will show up, costs will be saved and profits will be multiplied. All that is a matter of math. Let's talk about other things that we can't do without major, major efforts. And that's why I feel the power of sisterhood economy is important for us to go together. You know, there's that saying, stronger together. We are stronger together. And the more I see women normalize the idea of um, lots of women walking down the street in the night, the higher chance that there'll be better lighting and the lower chance there'll be Eve teasing or, you know, uh, hanky panky by any passers by. But is the answer to say put the women in cages and keep them at home? No. In most cases, because that answer is quantifiable, we'd rather how many cages are we building, how many women are going in there. It's not about the other things that we can do. So I think if we start fixing that and if women start recognizing that some women are very much so part of the patriarchal system, just like many men are really on the side of women in many cases, including not having to be forced to work, to be the bread earners and so on and so forth, we will start seeing this as a problem and not men versus women. Yeah, lots to think about. And um, I wish we had more time to get into each of the things that you said. Um, but so I was reading one of your interviews where you said that the way we talk about women, the way we report on women and how we reflect on women's stories uh, begins with how the media covers these stories. And I just wanted to know, from your sort of professional experience in media, in digital communication, where you have helped brands connect with women, how do you see women sort of leveraging the digital comms platform um, to be entrepreneurs? I think that's a great question. And it has two parts to it. One part is where brands need to start recognizing the importance of female voices voices of other minority genders into the communication, into the community, into the customers, right? So if they start seeing them as customers, they start talking with them. Uh, that realization is coming, but it's still slow. New age brands are waking up to it. Uh, some other brands are still doing pink washing. There are others that are trying to navigate the two. And there are some that have just given up because they don't understand it and probably will take longer, perhaps more traditional brands. But I think it's really important to recognize, and this is one part of my work that I'm very proud of, is that, you know, we actually, the people have really helped many brands rethink their approach to women. We have learned to say no to brands that want to do lip service and force them to think why a platform has said no to a brand when the brand was willing to pay money. Because we don't want you to believe that online safety is one Instagram. 
most. We don't want you to believe that showing pink balloons over pads uh, on Women's Day is the answer to celebrating women. Right? At Shri the People, it's Women's Day every day of the year. And so the more we get into brands and showcase them or uh, in a way which is integrated with real stories of real women going through real experiences, that's what brings uh, a shift in the way companies function. It doesn't happen overnight, but making a start and getting the right partnership in place is really critical for any brand that wants to um, have a genuine impact on on women. Uh, the second part is, uh, you know, the flip side of it, which is that how can more and more women think that they are creators? I think that's a great economy. Creators economy is a wonderful space and it continues to be one where we see um, opportunities um, emerging from spaces which people still think are laughable because they can't believe you could do a dance on uh, social media and get paid for it. I don't see anything wrong in it. I believe that there is um, there is demand for such content, there is interest in such content. I also feel it's a great way to innovate what is being said. You know, storytelling is at the heart of what we do, but it's not new. It's existed from the time uh, that man existed or, or was born. So we need to recognize that storytelling has to live up with the times. And I would definitely love to watch somebody dance or do a flip backflip or a front roll and tell me something that I don't know, right? Um, so the, the possibilities that digital has brought for creators is immense. At the same time, it's also brought a lot of uh, possibilities for those who are um, scared to leave out of home because families won't allow, uh, husbands will restrict. They could sit in a room like I am right now, for example, and literally do a uh, business. You know, somebody could help me get uh, another person employed and take a fees for it. Somebody could help me with a, a crochet for my baby blanket. I don't know. It could be anything. But I feel that we have this notion and this is something that came through a lot for me during my book writing. We have this notion of what is work? What is worthy of work? Right? I mean, is, is a person who is looking after the house not worthy of work? They've done their work. Um, even if we go, get into a very imperfect debate on what is work and also how it should be measured when somebody's at home, I recognize the need for such a debate. I'm not running away from it. But I don't understand why being a CEO is worthy of work and it's an important work, while being a housekeeper is not important. Same thing with the nature of work. If you're doing, if you're running a 1000 crore business uh, and versus somebody who's running a one crore business or a 10 lakh business or a 10,000 rupee business, it's important to note what that work brings to that person. That's where the worthiness is. It's not in the numbers of how big a market cap you have. Not important. The larger scheme of things, things will change for both men and women when they start respecting work for its work's sake, not what it hangs as a medal in front of them. I mean, I completely agree with you in terms of defining work and the nature of work, especially when it comes to women. And while the digital sort of landscape has changed how women contribute to the economy in a more sort of conventional or traditional sense, um, a lot of the conversation and debate around the role of women in economy kind of stops at how to move ahead in your career, how to negotiate higher pay, uh, maybe just managing your role as a caregiver and also being a full-time professional. Um, there are still certain topics that women hesitate to discuss. Um, you, don't, you are vulnerable about your health and reproductive health only with your sort of close, intimate circle. And this is why I think Gayatri, which is your initiative on women's uh, reproductive health, is such a game changer. But I'm also wondering how you got women to come forward and be vulnerable about issues that you know you you can't discuss with anyone but maybe your girlfriends. Yeah. You know, my struggle um, is a life struggle when it comes to women's health. Um, my idea is the game changer, but we haven't changed the game yet. Okay. Uh, we are on our path to do that. But we needed to make a start. Um, I have seen 
families and layers and layers of women across around me internalize pain, emotional pain, physical pain, period pain, I mean, every kind of pain. Our, um, you know, we would be great moms, great daughters, great daughter-in-laws, great sisters, depending on how much pain can we bear. I mean, I literally just don't know how that came to exist. It is, it is just such an, such an upsetting concept, right? You, you sacrifice from, from everything, from whether it's stuff on your plate, to your careers, to everything, and therefore you become the good person. I can't believe that this kind of a definition of what is success is been peddled to half the population only. There must be something really special about women. So, you know, these are the things that have disgusted me for all my career and I'm, all my life, actually. I've asked this question to myself as a kid. And, you know, like all children, everyone's innocent. So they have the most valuable basic question. Why does my brother get full jalebi and why do I get half? Right? It's just starting from that very point. So when I thought of the Women's Health Platform, it wasn't me. Uh, I, I actually ran experiments on Shida people, spoke to the women in the community, spoke to the doctors in the community, and all of them came back saying, we need this. It's absent. We need to prioritize women's health. Not only do we need to prioritize it, we need to recognize that they need solutions that are differently approached. And I'm thinking, why do women need different health solutions? Health is health, right? Majority of the research done across the world has been done on the male body. Therefore, the solutions that emerge are for the male body. And so the question is, when people go to the doctor, pain is pain, have a painkiller. It doesn't work like that. Female pain is linked with thousands of things, from her hormones, to her periods, to her reproductive cycles, and various other things. And we're not even noticing that. And I think that is really very fundamentally important for me to change that both doctors and women are democratizing the idea of why and how women should access health. In fact, in the book, the biggest chapter is women's health. And it pained me to write that because I was listening to girls tell me that they, they will only go to the doctor when they're pregnant fundamentally problematic and these are women from villages but i'll tell you my own experience i am 42 with two children i first went to a thyroid specialist after i was pregnant with my first child and discovered i have a massive thyroid problem if i had discovered this at 18 19 perhaps i would have had a far better runway to fix this than trying to now sort my life out before the birth of the baby as if the birth of the baby is the only reason I need to have good health. So we haven't looked at women beyond being producers of children, you know, or mothers. Until we start fixing that, we will not be able to prioritize women's health. So for me, the task is much bigger, is to offer a solution or with Gayatri and at the same time, make sure that women are beginning to understand their bodies better. We did about 5 billion in uh, YouTube views on women's health content. For this reason, every single doctor we see today who's a star on Instagram two years ago started on She The People with a lot of amazing content and has helped both us and themselves in this journey to democratize information on women's health. We do need to change one very fundamental thing. Women need to start thinking they need to prioritize their own health. And for me, as we offer Gayatri as a solution, that is really the fundamental movement of this mission. Let's realize we need to put our step, our step forward, our hands up saying, I need to get this checked. Everybody else come behind me. You know, that's really where one needs to fix. But we do have, I mean, I'm sure um, these are familiar to some of your audiences, but 60% of Indian women stay out of the workforce because they have one health problem or the other. Majority of the women, by the time they hit the doctor uh, with pain levels, have already reached stage four of endometriosis. Many of them don't know what endometriosis or PCOS is. Many of them don't know that they have fibroids and they should be removed, even though they're not doing anything to them in their body, for example. So there are all kinds of things. Ask a woman about um, health and she'll say, oh, I just get a sinking feeling once a while. 
the sinking feeling is linked directly to your hormones i'm not a doc but i'm hearing this from the doctors who are running the entire fundamentals of gayatri today that we keep saying mood swings ghabrahat ho rahi hai all this is fundamentally linked to our hormones which we are willing to happily ignore because it's just a mood swing you know what i mean such fundamental challenges with the way we're thinking about health yeah and i think this glorification like you said earlier of the struggle and you know powering through the pain um is actually not helpful at all especially when you have solutions out there but just because we're not open about these issues that we face um we're denying ourselves a lot of comfort and ease um i know you have to go so i will just go to my last question um you mentioned earlier when we were talking about sort of being a media professional that the internet and going digital kind of lowered the barrier to entry uh, a lot more people had access to information but were also being able to create more content and i'm wondering that these issues are not particularly limited to people with access to internet and technology but especially in our country where there are a lot of women that are outside of this circle so how do you see she the people or gayatri or any of the other sort of digital initiatives you've taken to kind of cross the barrier of going beyond digital that's a great question so um when we started out we used digital very soon we moved into an omni channel space okay o to o we call it offline to online online to offline why because we recognize that women like to meet sometimes inspiration comes in different packages and often that's in flesh and blood uh, but i think what uh, matters is that how do we scale enough to reach enough women so that they are able to touch and feel the idea of who we want to be for them uh, and therefore as a uh, technology shifts as new ideas come in as metaverse kicks in and i don't know what else will in the course of our lifetimes but i think fundamentally some access through the internet of sorts will be one of the biggest drivers of how more women join a movement now i can today align with what black lives matters uh, says or what dalit lives matters says not because i am standing on the street i can't go to every street to protest or for a night vigil i can go to my nearest street to do where the next protest is but eventually i need to partner with people through the internet by which i can um participate and add to their voice and movement right in each one of us is not just a not just a being we are out there we have a voice we have a we make ourselves count in in, in a larger cause so i think those pieces to me are fundamentally transformational from within the digital space and we should continue to celebrate that uh, for me at shri the people and at gayatri i think gayatri for example will have lots and lots of stuff happening off um, offline as well because it delivers health solutions right like whether it's about having a mobile van that goes places or whether it finds the customers uh, at office spaces and so on so i think it's a it's a strong uh, opportunity um, and a question of how we create that balance right um, but i think a lot of that is really depending on what people expect i just think that earlier businesses or people used to come to a place to shop the shop can go to them even if it's not online right so i think there are different ways to look at it but in in a in a broader conclusive way i would say that what um, what the power of the internet has done is uh, is really a great example of what she the people has become i uh, always have had the option of having a physical space we didn't which is why we have colleagues who are working from nainital and siliguri and truly reflecting the idea of india as opposed to eight people who live between gurgaon and delhi and come to the office and tell us what to do with the rest of the world right so ground up movements for me are very critical you have to go from below have to go from where people come from what their challenges are what they need solve and then come up with what you can offer them as a, as an enabler but not otherwise
Thank you so much for joining us today, Shelly. This conversation, it, I'm sure, is an inspiration, not just to budding entrepreneurs, but also encouraging women to talk a little bit more about their struggles and come together to find solutions. Do subscribe to Carnegie India's YouTube channel for more such content. Thank you.